The simplest kind of storage element is the latch. The latch is a storage element which is transparent with respect to the clock. There are two types of latches, active high latches and active low latches. The latch has two modes, transparent mode and opaque mode. In transparent mode, the output Q is exactly the same as the input D, and in opaque mode, the latch will keep the last value of D that it saw on the active phase of the clock. Therefore, it will be in memory mode. So on the left hand side, we see a, a, an active high latch. The active high latch will be transparent in the one phase of the clock and opaque in the zero phase of the clock. Let's see how this happens. So when we have a zero phase of the clock, the output Q does not respond to the input. We don't know yet what the output Q is during this period, but as soon as the clock goes to one, the latch goes into transparent mode. In transparent mode, Q is equal to D, and therefore the output Q will copy the input D. And therefore, we will see Q following D exactly. As soon as we enter the one phase of the clock, D is equal to zero, and therefore Q is equal to zero. Then D goes up to one, Q will follow it. D goes back to zero, Q goes back to zero. D rises to one, and Q follows it. Now, the, phase, the, the clock goes into the zero phase again. As soon as it goes into the zero phase, the latch goes into opaque mode, or in storage mode. Q and D are disconnected from each other, and Q keeps the last value of D that it saw uh, in the active phase of the clock. And therefore, Q will continue to be 1 throughout the zero phase of the clock. It really doesn't matter what happens to D during the zero phase of the clock, because Q will remain at the last value it saw. As soon as we enter the active phase of the clock again, the one phase of the clock, Q will again start to follow D, so it will go down to zero immediately, and then it will cop copy D as it goes up and down again. Of course, Q will not be exactly the same as D, there will be some form of delay, but we still haven't looked at delay in sequential circuits. Now, the, zero, uh, the uh, uh, active low latch is a latch which is transparent during the zero phase of the clock, so we will see exactly the opposite of what happened uh, in the previous latch. Uh, during the first one phase, it is undefined because we don't know what the initial state of Q was. As soon as we enter the zero phase of the clock, Q will follow D, so Q will first go down to zero and then will go back up to one. During the one phase of the clock, however, Q will remain at one because we don't know, uh, because uh, it has become opaque. When you go back to the uh, active phase zero, uh, Q would go down to zero because it sees D equal to zero as soon as it enters the active phase and then it will copy the pulse on D, and then on the, um, on the opaque phase again, D will continue to be zero, a Q will continue to be zero, which is the last value of D that it saw before the clock went inactive. So this is what a latch does. Latches are interesting elements uh, just because they are the building blocks we use to make registers. Registers, or flip-flops, are our main element of interest in sequential circuits. Uh, all of the pipelines we will design will use registers rather than latches. This doesn't mean that latches are never used on their own. They are sometimes used in, on their own in spe specialized circuits, and we will see this in uh, module 9. Now, let's look at how a latch is designed or made. So, uh, the main architecture used to create a latch is the multiplexer-based architecture. And so imagine that we have, um, we have a, a multiplexer whose select line is the clock signal. So um, Q will either be um, the one input when the clock is one or the zero input when the clock is zero. If we attach D to the one input, then this is obviously uh, an active high latch because Q will be equal to D when the clock is equal to one. But Q will keep its old value, Q old, when the clock is zero. So we have to have some sort of feedback like this. Uh, if we want to design an active low latch, either D is input to the zero input of the, of the multiplexer, or we could alternatively use clock bar as a select line instead of clock. Now, um, this feedback that's happening over here cannot be a short circuit. 
In other words, there has to be some storage mechanism in the feedback that is actively keeping the value of Q old when we want Q old to be kept. And we have already discussed in the previous video what kind of storage mechanism we want uh, to preserve the output value of Q. Uh, and so the uh, storage mechanism we use is a, uh, a pair of inverters, a pair of static CMOS inverters, to be very specific, which are connected in positive feedback. So in this case, Q is always going to keep its value uh, because it is being actively kept by positive feedback. Note that there are two nodes in this circuit, but these two nodes are capable of storing only a single bit of information because they are always logic uh, complements of each other. And so they do not carry two different bits of information. They carry a single bit. Now, um, we also need the ability to sometimes connect D to Q. So D is an, an input signal that comes from the outside, and we need to be able to connect D to Q somehow. Um, this is a conditional connection. It only happens when the clock is equal to 1 uh, in the case of, of, of an active high latch. So we need D to become Q, but only when the clock is equal to 1. So we use a switch here, and this switch will close when the clock is equal to 1. If we want to ensure that Q and D are true, are true copies of each other, not complement copies, we can also use an additional inverter here. Now, there's a problem when we are in transparent mode, because when we are in transparent mode, this node, let's call it Q bar, is being written to by two inverters. This inverter, the one that is trying to write the new value of D, and this inverter, the one that is trying to keep the old value of Q through the positive feedback. So there is a contention on node Q bar, and we need to disconnect this contention. We can do this very simply by also using another latch in the feedback path, um, and, and this latch, uh, sorry, we're using another switch in the feedback uh, path, but this switch is going to be activated by clock bar. So when clock is equal to, to 1, uh, the switch, switch 1, is going to be on, and switch 2 is going to be off. And therefore, Q is going to be a copy of D. So this is when clock is equal to 1, right? Uh, when clock is equal to 0, on the other hand, the uh, first switch S1 will be off and will disconnect D from Q and the feedback inverter will be connected and we will preserve the old value of Q. And therefore, we have two modes, transparent mode when clock is equal to 1 and opaque mode when clock is equal to 0. Now, um, we have to think about these switches, like we uh, represented them as um, ideal switches in both these cases. Uh, meaning that there are on, their on resistance is equal to zero, but we know that switches are made of transistors. So the switches S1 and S2 could be made using NMOSs or PMOSs. So which one do you use? When we have the option to use either NMOS or PMOS, we will always use NMOS because of the uh, superior mobility of electrons, which translates into a smaller on resistance for the same size. But let's consider this situation. Now, these two switches are going to pass on the same clock signal. So we can use each of them, uh, 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 you know, we can exchange them both uh, and have the same effect because both switches will be active when clock is equal to one and inactive when clock is equal to zero. This is why we use clock bar as an input to the PMOS. However, we know that the NMOS will manage to pass any zero volt in whole but will not manage to pass a VDD in home. We'll eat up a little bit, VDD minus V threshold. And we know that the PMOS can pass VDD in whole, but it fails to pass zero volt. It will pass it as absolute value V threshold P. And thus, when we use switches, S1 and S2 will not actually be either NMOS or PMOS. It will be a parallel connection of NMOS and PMOS. And, the and this circuit element is represented as a single element called the transmission gate. And this is the symbol for the transmission gate. So this is transmission gate. And transmission gates are used as uh, simple switches that pass the data from A to B or prevent the data from passing between A and B. Uh, there's a, a very important condition here. The control signal that goes to the NMOS has to be the opposite, the complement of the control signal that goes to the PMOS. What this means is that 
the NMOS and the PMOS are either both on or both off simultaneously. If X is 1, both will be on. If X is 0, both will be off. The objective of using a transmission gate is not to have the NMOS work some of the time and the PMOS work some of the other time. The objective is to allow the two of them when connected in parallel to pass zero volt and VDD in full. So they are supposed to work together and they're supposed to turn off together. And that's what a transmission gate is. Uh, we will often represent a transmission gate that is on as a short circuit, but be aware that the actual model, the more accurate model for an on transmission gate is a model with the on resistance of the NMOS and the on resistance of the PMOS in parallel with each other. So there is a finite resistance. We should have put this resistance here to represent the on resistance of switch S1. We should have put it here to represent the on resistance of switch S2, but we will often ignore this on resistance to simplify calculations.